this is Sandy. And Randy. And we're here on AT Corner. Being an athletic trainer comes with ups and downs, and we're here to showcase it all. Join us as we share our world in sports medicine. Welcome to another episode of AT Corner. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about something that I would say most clinicians would call a pain in the butt. And that is SI joint pain. Get it? Pain in the butt. Yeah, I get it. (laughs) By the way, later in the show, you'll hear the referred pain patterns and there might be some butt pain. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the goal for today's show is we'll review the anatomy relevant to the SI joint review the biomechanics of the SI joint, and then discuss the evaluation process for diagnosing SI joint pain, and discuss our treatment interventions and how do we approach SI joint pain. So if you're new, one of the things that we like to do is pair evidence and experience. And normally that's what we would do right now. We would usually start off with a relevant story or a case study or something to kind of bring this evidence to your clinical practice or what we've seen in clinical practice. Um, instead for this one, we're going to do it a little bit differently and we're going to kind of try and chime in throughout the episode and pair the evidence that Randy was reading in the literature and bring it back into what have we seen in clinical practice. So why don't we start off with the anatomy? Absolutely. So when you think of the SI joint, this is a very key structure when it comes to transferring forces from the lower extremity up to the spine and then vice versa, the spine down through the lower extremity. The ligaments that surround the SI joint are very strong. And, you know, just a few, just to name a few, the interosseous ligaments, which are the strongest of the supporting ligaments around this joint, the posterior sacroiliac ligament, sacrotuberous ligament, which everyone's familiar with because it's a key landmark when evaluating. Where is that one again? So that one sits kind of right in the middle of the glute. So if you were to come off the spine of the sacrum and then kind of go um, distal and lateral, you could mm-hmm. feel you should be able to fit a taut band okay. in there. Um, and then the sacrospinous ligament. The um, as far as the muscles that surround the joint, you have the lats that come down, connect through the thoracolumbar fascia, which will then blend into the glute max and the biceps femoris. Um, Transversus abdominis also attaches to the thoracolumbar fascia. So these muscles are joining a fascia that creates a lot of support and is key for the forced closure, forced closure of the SI joint. And then obviously we have to talk about glute max and then glute, gluteus medius, which, is, which stabilizes the pelvis in the frontal plane. So having a nice stable pelvis will help create an optimal position of this joint, which means optimal loads can be absorbed. So the SI joint is so unique because it really attaches to so many muscles above and below it. Absolutely. So we just talked about how, where everything is in this anatomy, but how do these structures actually work together to create motion? So the motion of the SI joint itself is very small with literature counting up to maybe four degrees of mutation, counter mutation. Mm -hmm. And then the supporting or the accessory motions are even smaller than that with the smallest and lateral bending being less than a degree so you have to appreciate that the motion of this is very small and almost arguably you can't detect by your eye Um, and i think that's really important to talk about when you're going to talk about later in the evaluation section yes absolutely it'll be very key later Um, as far as the functional mechanics of this joint during walking so when you're walking, the stance limb, in this case, we'll use the right leg. So. Yeah, let's, let's imagine the right leg. Yes. So the stance limb, as it progresses through the stance phase, that pelvis is going to go into an anterior tilt, which then causes the right side of the sacrum to go into uh, nutation. So nutation is forward, correct? Yes. So the, if you're thinking about the sacrum sitting in an anatomical uh, position, you have the top of the sacrum moving anteriorly and then the opposite counter nutation would be the top of the sacrum moving posteriorly yes and that actually occurs on the swing limb so the leg that's swinging through in this case we'll use the left as the left leg swings through the pelvis will rotate posteriorly causing the left side of the sacrum to counter nutate like you said moving posterior 
So the top right is moving forward and the top left is moving back. Yes. When you're standing on the right. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So you're kind of getting like a rotation. Exactly. It's all in an effort to keep that that pelvic bowl uniform and stable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's healthy SI joint movement. What would cause the SI joint to be unhealthy? Exactly. So first, before we get more into this, you know, we do want to differentiate between SI joint pain and SI joint dysfunction because there is a distinction in the literature. When we're talking about SI joint pain, we're talking about pain specific to the SI joint. When you hear SI joint dysfunction, that just means the joint is not operating properly. So in this case, we are talking about true SI joint pain. We're talking about pain in the joint. So keep that in mind as we go along. So these patients, in an acute sense, can have SI joint pain from a sudden rotation paired with an axle strain, which I believe you have experience with, right? Yeah, so a perfect example of this, something that happens to me all the time, is when I'm in the car, my parking brake is really, really tough to engage. Yes. So imagine I'm sitting in my car, feet flat on the floor, right? And I take my right arm and I try to engage the parking brake and it's really hard. So I pull it up. And in order to do that, I have to use my body. So my right leg is essentially doing an isometric hip extension Mm -hmm. movement. And my left leg is stabilizing me on the opposite side. So my, so it's more of like a hip flexion movement. So really I'm getting this torque in my hips. And I've noticed that because of that, I get a lot of SI joint pain just from Absolutely. pulling on the the parking brake. A, a, you know, a daily task that you have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as for those with micro trauma, and this kind of goes into the micro trauma because of the repeatedness of that motion, right, mm-hmm. is a failed load transfer. So failed load transfer is something that was really drilled into my brain in one of my rotations as a student. And if John ever finds this podcast, then I really, really hope that I'm explaining this as he would want me to. So the best way that I like to think about this is what is failed load transfer? It's basically when you are failing to transfer your load correctly. Mm -hmm. So this stems back to the transverse abdominis. The transverse abdominis is your deep core muscle. I like to call it the corset muscle. That's how I explain it to my patients. It goes from the front of the abdomen around, it attaches in your ribs and on your pelvis and goes all the way around and attaches into your spine. So essentially what it's supposed to do is protect your back. So because it's a deep core muscle, it's supposed to turn on before you do any limb movement. So it's supposed to engage before you pick up a box or before you lift your leg to step up or really anything that your extremities are moving on a stable trunk it's essentially to protect your back Mm -hmm. when that's a healthy movement when you have failed load transfer then you can no longer rely on your transverse abdominis to take that load so what's happening is your transverse abdominis has a faulty movement pattern that movement pattern has been altered and maybe the ta is not doing what it's supposed to be doing so a good way that I like to visualize this and so, and what John taught me is if you have someone hook lying or supine on the table and you have them do a glute bridge, you're watching their hips and you're really trying to see if there's any deviation. So like if one hip is lower than the other or if they're not moving at the same rate, really if if the movement is dysfunctional. What you want to do to decide if it is the fault of the TA is you are going to create that TA with your hands. So as a clinician, you're going to come in and place your hands around the patient, thumbs um, by their belly button and fingers scoop up and around near the back. So you're creating that forced closure externally. What their TA is supposed to be doing, you are creating for them. So when you create that TA motion for them. You're going to have them do that glute bridge again. And if that glute bridge is better and that motion, that dysfunctional motion does not continue to happen, then that tells you, so the TA is the cause of the dysfunction. By it not firing, 
it is causing this these deviations Mm -hmm. in the hips yeah and along the lines of that if if that muscle is not firing correctly or even the other supporting muscles like the lats and glutes to the si joint that now creates a force that needs to be absorbed by another structure well that's going to fall on the ligaments of the joint and this is where i think the pain that these patients feel are maybe not coming from the joint itself because the literature that has looked into okay well where exactly is this pain coming from um, has been very inconsistent i think it's i view it as it's coming from the ligaments surrounding the joint that remember ligaments are a connective tissue so if the ligaments are having to absorb more mechanical force than they should be they're going to become painful and they're going to have to adjust well they found that in connective tissue there are contractile properties in what's called myofibroblasts and what these cells do is they can cause contracture so if there's a lot of load that's creating trauma within the ligaments of this joint and then these myofibroblasts are now creating a contracture that's pain and that could be why when you're palpating the sacrotuberous ligament in those with si joint pain that's why it may feel like a tight muscle necessarily because it's in a contracture so that could be the consequence of a failed load transfer creating that pain. Before I learned about failed load transfer, I didn't realize how many patients actually had dysfunction in their TA and in their movement patterns. But ever since I learned that simple test of creating that force closure and seeing if that force closure assists their movement, Mm -hmm. then I found out that I needed to do TA with everyone. I probably do TA work to start 90% of my patient load. Exactly. It's a very important core muscle to get people to learn to fire. Uh, The thing about the TA is it is difficult to learn how to fire Mm -hmm. at first. Yes. For a lot of people, it is difficult. But once they do learn it, they and, you know, a lot of people, I am certainly an instant gratification kind of person. (laughs) You are. (laughs) And with the TA, it's so hard. You have to slow down and you have to tell them it's not going to be an overnight process. But once it, once they start to get that TA, you're going to see those results. That You're going to see the differences in their movements. And it's mm-hmm. especially in the patients who know their bodies, like all your endurance runners, yep. your performers, your swimmers, all those people especially are going to feel the difference Absolutely. when they start using their TA. So when a patient comes in with, SI joint pain, and this was very interesting as I was reading, is they're going to complain of pain rarely above L5. So if they're complaining of pain above the level of L5, it may it's probably not the SI joint that's causing the pain. It might be somewhere else. So remember, as you're going through this, to rule out any other low back pathologies like a you know a disc herniation or you know um, a stenosis or anything like that, but these patients will mostly have pain around that posterior glute. Um, the patients will; these patients will also complain of pain with sitting on a hard surface or changing positions, whether it's standing from sitting or going from uh, standing to sitting. Because again, what's happening there? The nutation and counter nutation is you're taking weight. Exactly, and that load. You know, it's mm-hmm. transferring load. So if you have a failure to transfer load, that's the mechanism right there, and you're seeing it. As far as referred pain that these patients could have is they'll complain of pain in their buttock, their posterolateral thigh, which makes sense with the biceps femoris connecting to some of the ligaments that attach to that sacrum, but also the groin as well, which is actually going to be very important in one of the diagnostic tests that we'll go over. So then are we seeing when people have hamstring, you said biceps femoris plays a big role Mm -hmm. uh, in the attachment site or the origin site? Yeah. Are we seeing in our hamstring, have you seen in your hamstring patients any SI joint complications? Well, well, that's actually funny that you bring that up because they've done some studies before where, you know, those with hamstring pain or hamstring uh, strains, they worked on the mobility of the SI joint or what I would prefer more the connective tissue around the SI joint, and it actually helped with their hamstring pain. So absolutely, they, they can go hand in hand. And not to bring in a total another can of worms, but I can't help to make that connection to when you're doing 
when you're working with the hamstrings to create that muscle energy mm-hmm. in the SI joint. Absolutely. So when you're evaluating someone with um, SI joint pain, right, we talked about how it presents and the history they'll probably go over, but then we've all learned about the pain provocation test, right? And everyone's probably familiar with the Laslet rule, even though they may not know the name. And essentially what that is, is the rule is that if three of five tests are positive, then you can have high confidence. And, you know, for those who've read the literature, you know, it has high sensitivity and specificity and all that. You can have high confidence that the pain is coming from the SI joint. And what these tests are, are it's the distraction test, compression test, uh, thigh thrust, Gaines lens and sacral thrust, which if you go to our YouTube, we have a video on how to perform these tests to give you an idea of what they are. Uh, or a good refresher. Exactly. Uh, that's a very common one that most people learn as their rule. And it is, it when you use that rule, it is very good at identifying SI joint pain. Uh, a new one that I learned as I was reading the literature is the Kurosawa diagnostic scoring system and essentially what they did is they kind of did a similar thing where they grouped a bunch of tests but this time they assigned points to it Uh, how this system is made up is the one finger test is three points so the one finger test is positive if the patient points to their psis as the source of pain so that's three points you know i try to get my patients to point with one finger and they end up like circling the area exactly (laughs) Uh, groin pain is two points, which again, th- that's a referred a, pain. A referred pain, and it shows how big of a deal it can be to indicate SI joint pain. Uh, pain with sitting on a chair, sacroiliac joint shear test, which essentially is just pushing on that SI joint to create shear, tenderness of PSIS, and then tenderness of the sacrotuberous ligament were all one point. And what they used as their cutoff was if a patient scored more than four or five points that had a high sensitivity and specificity for SI joint pain. So if they scored more than four or five points, you could have confidence in your decision that the SI joint is the cause of pain. That's what we need to focus on. Now, we can't talk about the SI joint without also talking about SI joint mobility tests. And, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people feel comfortable with them, and there's a ton out there. We're not going to, you know... Go Sp- over all yeah, we're not going to spend a whole time going over all of them. But what I thought was very interesting, if you remember, we talked about the SI joint doesn't move very much. And you can almost argue that the movement that it does have can't be a, um, caught by the human eye. So when we're doing these tests, literature is very inconsistent and they've shown to be not very reliable at identifying SI joint movement. And I know what people are probably thinking, like, oh, I do it all the time. I see the movement. I see which one's stuck, which one's free. What I would argue is when you put your thumbs on the, you know, on the PSIS, what are your thumbs over? Tissue. Exactly. Soft tissue. It's the same thing when we do kinematic studies, right? You put the little reflective marker, the video game reflective markers on, mm. but that's over skin. So technically you're not getting, you may be getting more of the skin motion and the tissue underneath than true bone motion. Well, that's the same idea here. Which is not, which is not saying that it's not giving you some information. Exactly. You're, I'm not saying you can't get information from this. I think we need to define the information better. So instead of saying, I'm looking at the SI joint and this, this side of the sacrum is stuck. Well, maybe it's not the sacrum itself. Maybe it's the connective tissue underneath. We just talked about how extensive the connective tissue overlies this area. So what if when you're doing these tests, the motion that you see restricted isn't the bone or the joint itself, but the soft tissue? Mm -hmm. So you still have valuable information. We just need to define it better. That's how I think we should be looking at these SI joint mobility tests. So don't just throw them out. Just redefine what you're looking at. Well, and that makes so much sense leading into the next thing, why manual therapy is such a good treatment for this. Exactly. It could definitely, one, help with pain. Just being able to work with someone with your hands helps their pain. You know, literature behind that has been very supportive. But also you may make an effect on the soft tissue itself. You know, working on the connective tissue to loosen it up or let that collagen not clump up into one area, but let it spread out as you should, as it should, as you're healing. I have so many patients with SI joint pain and usually the culprit, well, I have, a, I, especially in my performer specific mm-hmm. population, 
A lot of them have hip hiking issues. So when they're doing that, their QL is shortened. And so I'm having to deal with a lot of QL spasm. And it's interesting that you bring that up and that you like to work on the QL because the QL does share attachments to the thoracolumbar fascia. So if that's in spasm, that means the rest of the musculature that is connecting to that fascia may not be functioning properly and then failed load transfer. And then also, if it's in spasm, it could affect how the pelvis sits. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as manual therapy, a lot of people like to go with manipulation for this and the literature behind it as far as well when you think of manipulation you think of oh the joint is being adjusted it's the bones are moving right but the literature is very inconsistent on if um there's actually a change in bone position with some studies saying no there wasn't a change in bone position after manipulation but that still doesn't mean it can't help because as clinicians, we've seen benefits from it. So I think, again, manipulation can have an effect on soft tissue and connective tissue. So maybe that pop and you know the manipulation that you're going with, maybe it's relieving spasm or loosening that connective tissue. And that's where we bring, where, that's where we bridge the evidence and experience because, yeah, the literature is saying that maybe this is not actually what we're doing, but in clinical practice, we're seeing positive outcomes from doing these things. So really, if you are finding positive outcomes, then why listen to something that's saying that don't do this? Exactly. And I would say to redefine what's happening, not just like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm moving the bones. Well, no. It might be the soft tissue itself. So I think you just have to redefine it, not just throw it out because the literature says, hey, bones may not move. Well, that doesn't mean that it still can't be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And it also goes to muscle energy. You know, same thing. Muscle energy has a huge effect on soft tissue itself. So that could be another reason why those that are doing muscle energy for SI joint pain are seeing a benefit because it's affecting the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. So um, another key to the treatment of... SI joint pain is our rehab. And I think our rehab really has to focus on working on those synergies and load transfer. You know, there's a huge lat and glute synergy, you know, from the lat and the contralateral glute. Well, let's work on that. Let's work on that synergy working together because if those muscles are working properly, it's going to create a lot of tension through that thoracolumbar fascia, which creates an optimal force closure, less shear on the SI joint, which means less shear goes to the supporting ligaments, less pain. And then also goes to your core, right? The transversus abdominis, the obliques, they do have connections to the thoracolumbar fascia. If you train those properly, you're getting more tension through their optimal tension, better force closure. Mm -hmm. So the focus needs to be on making these muscles all work together because it is a huge synergy in that area. And there's so much going on in that area. Absolutely. So that was kind of the main... That was the, like, the meat and potatoes of today's show. So, like we like to do with every show, we want you guys to be able to take away specific action points to take to your clinical practice. So, obviously, I totally believe in doing TA with as many people as need it, which is probably more than you think. And what would you take away from everything that you've said today? What is your action item? I would say the biggest thing to take away is the SI joint is surrounded by very strong ligaments that make this joint very limited in motion. The pain that these patients are probably complaining of is coming from those ligaments and coming from the soft tissue around this joint. So our focus should be working on the soft tissue around it to relieve the pain, relieve any spasm that's around it, and then work and the rehab should be focused on the synergies, the core, the glutes. That's what I would say we should focus on when we have SI joint pain. So that went by super quick, but I think we covered a lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know what they say. Time flies when you're having fun. (laughs) Randy and his cliche jokes. That's what we're all about here. Too bad I don't have the old in the background. We should add that. Sorry, I'm not that techie. I can do that manually. Do it. I think that was good. So speaking of techie, if you want to see 
our citations on our really cool website that I made, then... There was the text anyway. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Then you can head over to our website. I think Randy used, what, 14 for this? Yeah, that sounds about right. So go ahead and go over. It will be under citations and resources, and it's a blog with all of our education sections. Absolutely. Take a look at you know what I looked at. And remember, this is my interpretation of the research that I read. So if you read it a different way or you've used something different in the in the past that's worked, please, we'd love to hear about it. And if you want to comment on this episode and let us know what you do for your SI joint patients, then head over to facebook.com slash group slash AT Corner Podcast and join our AT Corner community. Yeah, we would love to hear from you guys. There's only one membership question, and that's how did you hear about this podcast? Uh, and then you'll automatically be approved. That's easy peasy. Mm-hmm. So what's on the schedule for our next show? So if you're new... Every other episode we do is education or stories or experience. So this one's education. Next episode's going to be experience slash stories. So we're going to be talking more about working as an athletic trainer with other healthcare professionals. So that includes physical therapists. Nurses. Physician assistant. OTs. EMTs. Anyway, it's going to be a really cool episode. And then after that, we're going to interview a dual credentialed PTAT. And he's going to talk a little bit about the differences and similarities between our two professions. Nice. That's awesome. That will uh, definitely help with for students that might be confused on what they want to do or those PTs that may not know what an AT does. Or, or... an AT who doesn't know what a PT does. There's a lot more than you think. I know. It, it blew my mind. Yeah. So don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And let's wrap it up. Thank you for helping us showcase athletic training behind the tape.